Hey, Rachel. Hey, Brian. So how was your week? It was interesting. Like, I feel like I finally have this calling. A call? I, I've been dying for a calling. Share it. Maybe I can <laughs> join like, you in your calling. <laughs> yeah, join me. Join me. Well, you're you're part of this. So um, everywhere I go, I feel like people are summoning members of Generation X to stand up and fight cancel culture. Why us? I, I don't know why us. I mean, <laughs> where are you what hearing we... this? <laughs> Who is summoning you? Fox <laughs> News. It's Fox clip. News. Fox News. Yeah. Okay, yes. we'll talk about that after the intro. This is Nope. The podcast where we shut it down. We're just a couple of New York Jews talking about the news, beating back the blues. We made a podcast and news. Why? Laugh so we don't cry. Come and join us for the ride. Welcome to me. Okay, Rachel, so tell me more about this call to arms to fight cancel culture among the Gen Xers. So I, it was very unusual. There was this clip that kind of went viral on Twitter from Fox News where they were just like, why, why don't we just play it? up ahead. Plus, cancel culture is spreading like wildfire. There is now a call for Generation X, that is X, to lead the charge to save America from the social media mob. Can they do it? Okay, I'm inspired. I'm inspired. (laughs) Now I I mean, if you've ever been inspired, this is the moment. (laughs) Clear my calendar. It's a call to arms. (laughs) I have my purpose. But of all the people to call to to fight this, why us? Like we're lazy. We're we're, it's it's like slackers. We don't want anything. Thirty years after the Gen X movement, like, and we're still slacking. Look, you're living in your parents' house. (laughs) Yes, I'm totally living in my parents' house. And until a couple of days ago, my parents were here too, (laughs) living with me. (laughs) You're wearing your your high school clothes that you left in the closet. This is exactly. I see your books, your textbooks from high school behind you. You're living the Gen X dream. I am totally living the Gen X dream and I will not be fighting cancel culture because it's BS and it doesn't exist. But that that goes into my personal story of this week that I want to tell you about. So I've been dying to tell you. So I got um, ratioed this week on Twitter for the first time. I know what that word means. I mean, I know what that word means. So it means like it refers to a moment when the number of your replies to a tweet greatly exceeds the number of your likes. Oh, and I feel a good, good or bad thing. It means you've you've, I think it's bad. It means you've said something bad because like people are responding to you and not liking it. But like, you know, in order to be officially ratioed, there's no like concrete metric. But I think the ratio should be at least two to one. Right. But mine is one to one. So but still people are just like, I'm here for the ratio. Oh, look (laughs) at you. You're going down. And so what I said was this this is a KPI that people like strive for. Like, yes. Okay. Well, I don't know if they strive for it. Maybe trolls strive for it. I certainly don't. But what I said was relatively unobjectionable. I said, repeat after me, cancel culture is not a thing, which I, it's fairly innocuous. Yeah, I saw right? that. I didn't even think to like hit hit like because it's so self-evident. It's so obvious, <laughs> right? So, I mean, this thing has gotten like millions of impressions. The trolls came out of the woodwork and the first high profile person to interact with me about this was a British actor named James Dreyfus, who said that he was, quote, canceled and erased from a job publicly for asking Stonewall for a respectful debate. Now, I don't know who this person is, nor do I know the circumstances of his erasure. Like, wait, like Stonewall the bar? Like, exactly. I don't know what Stonewall is. Like the Stonewall to Inn. A bar? Like, <laughs> so I had no idea like what he was talking about. So I did a Google search and I found that he had made some pretty offensive comments about transgender people. And he was one of those people who signed the letter defending J.K. Rowling, who had made some anti-trans comments. And were these grounds for dismissal from his job on Doctor Who or whatever? 
whatever he was on. I have no <laughs> Dr. idea. Dr. Seuss. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Seuss, Dr. Who. It's a personnel issue. And it is not for me to say. But it's not like he was canceled for absolutely no reason out of nowhere. So I so when he responded to me, I said to him, we tell ourselves stories in order to live, Ooh. which is a Joan <laughs> Didion <Snap>. quote. <laughs> and nobody in this Twitter thread uh, is a reader of Joan Didion, I guess. So they accused me of being an insensitive asshole to this poor canceled guy and that I was telling myself a story that cancel culture doesn't exist when it's everywhere. So, okay. So that was one thing. Then I got a comment from this guy, John Dennis, who is the chairman of the San Francisco Republican party, (laughs) all two (laughs) members of it. (laughs) And he ran for Congress actually against uh, Nancy Pelosi. And he said in response to my tweet, that cancel culture doesn't exist. He said, quote, tell that to Parler, Alex Jones, Tracy Beans, Stefan Molyneux, Mindy Robinson, Parler, Donald Trump, my pillow, and Dr. Seuss. And I'm just like, Jesus Christ, like these are the neediest cases. Like these are <laughs> Wait, and, and plus he said Parler twice. He so said clearly. Parler twice. He really cares about Parler. And who is Tracy Beans? <laughs> She's been canceled. That's that's how you know she's been canceled. You would have known who she is. But she's she's been erased. (laughs) She's she's been unpersoned. So I responded telling him that he's proving my point that like with the example of Dr. Dr. Seuss, who was not canceled, the family decided not to publish six titles, as is their right to do. But no, this was unacceptable to him because he said that the Democrats were behind the pressure campaign, forcing the Seuss estate to stop publishing on Beyond Zebra and and like walking down McDougal <laughs> Street and whatever. So like, okay, that's that. <laughs> okay. So then, <laughs> then there's this other guy who kept popping up to ask me to Google when Harry became Sally and oh, see what happens. Uh... So first of all, this is like a copyright <laughs> issue. And like, I'm glad that Nora Ephron is not around to see this. She, she would be would mortified, be... yes. Yes. So when Harry became Sally is a book by a conservative scholar framing gender dysphoria as a mental illness. And Amazon recently said that they won't carry these types of books that frame LGBTQ identities as mental disorders, as is their right to do. Again, so, private, I mean, private entity, conduct your business however you like. So that's just a sampling. And then I wake up this morning and I see that my Twitter and Instagram accounts have been attempted to be logged in by random people. My Twitter account, people reported my tweet for harassment. I don't know who this is harassing by saying cancel culture is not a thing. And one of the people in this thread threatened to call my manager. And I was like, (laughs) go ahead. He's a seven year old boy. Or or like you could call my dog. Like you could call Coco. You answer to nobody. Right. (laughs) I don't answer to anybody except myself. I was like, I will talk to myself. So another one was um, digging up old tweets. They were like, they're like, oh, now you've opened yourself up. You've been on Twitter for a long time. You're going to find something. And like, I mean, listen, I've been on Twitter for a long time. You worked at Twitter. (laughs) I worked at Twitter. I'm sure in that time that I've been on Twitter, I've said something that was offensive at some point to somebody. And if that is the case, I will own it and I will apologize. I will not sit here complaining about the culture of cancellation. Okay. And so this person is like, like, look what you said and had like a screenshot of a tweet where I said Roseanne was canceled. And I was like, yes, a television show that is the one context in which cancellation is appropriate, you know? So I realize this is a long facocta story. No, it's but, worth it. This is an but, important <laughs> tale to be told. But like all these people who are whining about cancel culture as the scourge of civilization, they're actively trying to dox anybody who exercises their right to free speech by acknowledging that the whole thing is fucking bullshit. So keep on coming for me, you idiots. And to paraphrase Omar Little from The Wire, you come for the queen. You best not miss. <laughs> I think <laughs> Bethany. I think Bethany said that on Real Housewives. Also, she, she took it from Omar Little. Yeah. <laughs> That was awesome. That was yeah. that wasn't even a per- that should be a whole episode. That should be- I mean, it's just I, you should go through the it it is fascinating how just exercised people got over this. It is um Well, I hope is- they I hope they found it cathartic and it's out of their <laughs> system and I'm sure they'll all settle down to their domestic happy lives and um 
leave yeah, me alone. Yeah, people for now. need some. People need help, really. Like, just go people... bake some banana bread, like the rest of us. Or for something. real. Guess, okay. Yeah. Well, this week I have <laughs> much tamer, much lighter story. I was not doxxed or ratioed by anybody. <laughs> Tell um, me. This just happened today at work, actually. So you know, I work with a lot of young entrepreneurs. I coach and mentor them. We invest in them, and they're really amazing. Like, I don't know how they have the energy and focus to do what they do. Like, you know, it's all very risky. Oh, they're amazing. So yeah. I was uh, I was meeting with, I had a mentor meeting with one of our founders. I won't give her name, but she's amazing. Uh, she's in the uh, clinical health space. And uh, sh- they're so focused. They have no time. And she revealed to me that she was hatching a scheme for a side hustle. And I'm like, oh, my God, you must be really passionate about this if you're finding time for a side hustle. She's like, well, I'm not really doing it, but I'm sort of, you know, baking, baking the idea. I said, what is this? She says, well, my friend and I are going to start a charcuterie business. I said, Ooh. okay, that's very interesting. And she goes on like that, you know, we're two hip city girls and we want to like make our charcuterie. And I said, oh, I love charcuterie. What are your favorite meats that you're going to put on this? And she goes, well... I don't really like the meats. I said, oh, well, you're going to focus exclusively on the cheeses. Like, what are your favorite cheeses? And she goes, I don't really like cheese. Wait, so what is it? Like gherkins? <laughs> right. So I'm like, so what's going to be on your charcuterie plate? And she said, you know, like the dried fruits and the candied walnuts and the cornichon and things like that. I'm like, that seems like a limited market. Like maybe you could like find a channel sales partner. You could be like a subcontractor to someone whose specialty is the meats and the cheeses. And they're like, oh no, what are we going to do? We're not expert in dried fruits and candied walnuts and they can outsource it to this person (laughs) and still when when you talk about market size that's something we always ask as investors we ask the entrepreneurs like how but how big is this market and the big thing is like one billion is never enough it's got to be like 10 billion or bigger so you know what what is this a venture scalable business the, the dried apricot business but only I for mean, charcuterie costco plate. has kind of like dominated that space you know I think, yeah that's pretty good but then she made me aware of something that we broke the news we covered first she's like well there's also grazing tables oh grazing I'm like, tables i'm like yeah. don't, oh. don't get me started like <laughs> rachel and i are the world's foremost experts on grazing tables but she didn't know about the the trend that we covered probably two years ago of not having any plates and just putting them on the table and she was fascinated by that and she one-upped it with a a trend that i didn't know about which was um table nachos did we we didn't discuss this this is a new no we talked about french fry tables but table nachos i think are a new iteration this is a tiktok thing right so you basically like take a bag of tortilla chips you throw it out on the table (laughs) then you melt like a bucket of cheese you pour it on the table and then you scatter the toppings on top of it um um, who's doing this in the time of COVID? <laughs> like, who's... It seems like the least hygienic thing ever. <laughs> well, A, you can't have people in your house. Maybe it's a family, like, it's like family game night. You have family table nachos or something. It's like for and, a pod. It's like a pod night. Yeah, and how are you going to get the cheese? I mean, some of the cheese is going to dry on the table, and it just seems like a disaster waiting to happen. So my friend who is... Uh, going to start this business i have every faith in you i do wish you would stick to the healthcare tech since that's what we invested in however, <laughs> however i wouldn't i wouldn't mind making a side bet on the charcuterie there might business. be some synergies <laughs> i don't know maybe you you book an appointment and get like a charcuterie right. delivery or put it in the waiting room of a doctor yeah right that's what that, like they're not catered properly like why should you have to look why should you have to read old issues of people magazine when you could have some delightful a nacho table Iber- <laughs> Iberico ham with a nice candied <laughs> walnut okay let's move on to the notes okay. rachel um, there's a lot of notes this week we, we okay don't have- so yeah, everyone's been talking about NFTs, which stands for non fungible tokens, Nifties. and I knew we would yeah. eventually have to discuss it. Um, it's it's basically a proof of authenticity. It's a line of code on the blockchain that says that you own a particular asset. And I realize this is like a house of mirrors. It's like what is that? What is that? What is that? And you go inside. It's like 
going in a wormhole inside a wormhole. And it's the kind of thing that makes you get a migraine. So it's a, tur it's it's, a turducken of it's crypto, a turducken right. of crypto definitions. And it's all anybody is talking about on Clubhouse and people are selling NFTs for all sorts of weird shit. Like Jack Dorsey is currently selling an M NFT to his first tweet in a charity auction and the bidding is up to $2.5 million. So you oh. own this tweet. I, I don't even understand how that is something that can be owned. Yes. Um, but so cryptocurrency, you know, it's been around for more than a decade. It's a big thing. Bitcoin is up pretty high lately. And this is kind of the next wave of that. And it's been touting it as a huge innovation in the art world in particular. And so this week, NFTs were in the news because a digital artwork sold for $69.3 million at Christie's, which is a record price. Um, the story was on the front page of the Wall Street Journal, and there were so many things about it that I didn't understand. And I'm not some like person who just fell off of a turnip truck. Well, you I've worked covered, for a crypto. You, you covered it? Uh, yeah, right? I've consulted. I covered securitized assets. I covered CDOs and synthetic CDOs, collateralized debt obligations. I've consulted for a blockchain company. So, you know, I know about this stuff more than the average person. But so here's the first thing that I don't understand. <laughs> so, you have a list. <laughs> so it's it largely concerns the, the identities of the players involved in this transaction. Like the artist's name is Beeple. Yes, Beeple. Like people, <laughs> Beeple, but like but Beeple. Beeple. <laughs> yes, with E-E, -E, Beeple. Yes. Oh, yes. And now Beeple, who I've never heard of before, holds the title for the third most expensive work of art ever sold by a living artist after David Hockney and Jeff Koons, both of whom I have very much heard of. <laughs> Wait, okay. I have a question, though. Is Beeple an artist that people had heard of before this, or is he purely a product of nifty culture? I think he's a product of nifty culture. Yes. Okay. Okay. I don't think he's been like in the art world. You know, I don't think he was at like he's not art Banksy. Basel. He's not Banksy. No, he's not Banksy. So, um, so the artwork in question that was sold is called Every Day, the First 5,000 Days. And it's a collage of digital artwork that Beeple made every day for over 13 years, including a portrait of Beeple's uncle, a post apocalyptic <laughs> cyborg fantasy, and a picture of Michael Jackson lactating who among <laughs> us wouldn't want that um so so i don't understand the art which is Wait, fine i, I don't question. understand I a lot question. of art were there like <laughs> were there like different panels with those images or were they yes combined and you could zoom in and of... zoom out and anyone could look at this it's like it's a digital artwork it can but it be was, but it wasn't like the, his the artist's uncle like lactating on michael michael Jackson's. jackson no, no no each is a separate panel okay. and they're all it's like a collage you yes. know so okay so the other thing that i really don't understand is the identity of the person who bought this work and also his spokesman so the buyer goes by the name metacoran <laughs> <laughs> and he's a cryptocurrency investor in Singapore. He goes by one name. And his spokesman is named tu tu Tubador, like Troubadour, but T-W-O. And Tubador confirmed the that that Metocoran, Metocoran bought the art to the Wall Street Journal. So we've got this cast of characters of Wait, people. These are, all, these are all like Reddit handles, by the way. Like, yes. These are, yes, these are not real people, right? No, it's like, it sounds like a Marvel franchise. <laughs> it's like people, Tubador, Metocoran. And then here's where it gets really crazy. So this artwork is digital. It's infinitely reproducible in perfect form uh, and anybody can download it and the buyer does not even get the copyright the artist owns the copyright so what do you get for 69 million dollars is the question right you get, so you get a, proof that you own the quote-unquote original whatever the original is whatever the original is you get a line of code in the blockchain saying you are the one true owner and you also have the right to display the work in digital museums and you can then tokenize the digital <laughs> display which is what metacoran did with a previous work by beeple so this so just it's happened like a current, so it's a current so it's a like a meta currency it's like bought with a currency that's not a currency that is logged on the blockchain and then becomes another currency. Another currency, right. So Metacoran created this B20 token and sold them for 36 cents a piece for not for this artwork, but for other people, people works. And so there, <laughs> and he bought this, he bought real estate in like a digital museum 
and sold off these tokens. And so they went from 36 cents to $16, meaning that the market cap for this exhibition (laughs) is now $163 million. So it's, it's like, um, a Ponzi scheme inside of a Ponzi scheme, or perhaps this whole thing is like performance <laughs> this is like, this art. Is like the, this is like the Matrix. Like this doesn't exist. <laughs> it's like, it's <laughs> nonsense. I mean, I cannot get my head around it. So I, I don't know. Congratulations, people. people. <laughs> you you pulled it off. You, whatever the hell you were trying to do, you did it. You did it. You <laughs> and did it. we're the greater fools. So so now we have this asset class that you bought for sixteen cents, and it's now thirty six cents, and it's now sixteen dollars. Is there like a first derivative of that can you then like launch tokenize a, a that, tokenize they, that you can tokenize asset? anything it's like it, it's like synthetic so CDOs, here's the real question you know? can we tokenize this podcast can we i put, would love to at, tokenize at one this point podcast. We, we were on the blockchain right we, yes, <laughs> we were swinging <laughs> from the blockchain <laughs> tethered to the blockchain somehow we became untethered and i think we should tether ourselves again i think we should tokenize i think so yes let's do it yes i'll be the token podcast on the let's in the let's, in, let's investigate it someone could own it i don't care uh, okay I don't care who it is can i just know people Nope, people. Nope. Nope. <laughs> NFTs. No. Okay, I think this not. is not the last time we're going to hear about this. And no. unfortunately, probably not the last time we're going to find ourselves forced to talk about this. So yes. we'll deal with that. Gird our we'll loins. Cross, okay. We'll cross that token <laughs> when it comes. Okay. I have a far more concrete, although not really, topic to discuss. Um, climate change is in the news. <laughs> <laughs> climate change it's it's everywhere it's everywhere right but there is a lot of talk about saving the species right so elon musk wants to send us to mars um there's this like plant thing where like there's seeds in norway that they're putting in the ice cap to save the seeds for the future so there is a new very uh proposal that people are taking very seriously it is by a professor an academic named jekan fanga of the university of arizona And this was unveiled at the annual Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers Aerospace Conference, which is a mouthful. And if if you're going to commit to saying that and attending that, you know it's serious. You're serious, yeah. (laughs) So here's the proposal. He wants to have a modern global insurance policy. What does that mean? It means that he wants to send 6.7 million sperm to the moon. Okay. Yeah. And it doesn't sound like that many. No, like, isn't that like one shot of sperm? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, isn't that like just how much comes I, out like, I in one go? <laughs> I mean, I've never counted. I, think, but they're like, I mean, I feel like that's, yeah. I mean, that when you see those illustrations, right. like in health class, there's like one big egg and like 6.7 million sperm all chasing <laughs> it. <laughs> So I don't know. The, well, it turned okay. So I I saw that. I assumed it was human sperm. It's actually of of animals as well, and it's supposed to be of all the animals in the world. So it's so, like Noah's Ark on the moon. Yes, in fact, that's what they're calling it—a modern ark, right? Okay. And uh, they want to store them not just on the moon, but beneath the moon's surface, and they're calling it lunar. The the paper was called lunar pits and lava tubes for modern ark. So it turns out that there are these lava pits and tubes on the moon i don't know if it's really? real or lava pits? <laughs> there's not actual lava in them i think they're like extinct lava pits okay and a, a web of tubes interconnecting them um i think they're getting ahead of themselves if they're not sure that these tubes are there and we're already <laughs> like about to start shooting sperm at them yeah but... i think they need like a <laughs> this needs to be like thought a out mock-up. a little better. <laughs> A clickable prototype of some sort. Yes, an MVP. So, um, <laughs> so they say that the human they're going to make a human seed vault in these Luna lava pits that will protect them against major temperature swings and meteorites and radiation. But to get there, they need an actual arc, <clears throat> and um, they outlined what it would take to build this on the moon and 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 transport all this sperm uh and they said how, they were... how what do they need to transport it like six it could fit like, like on the head moon. of a pin <laughs> i can't believe this segment has devolved into wild speculation about how big 
<laughs> the volume of sperm. <laughs> we could probably Google it right now and figure it out. But let's not do that because it would be less fun. Um, <laughs> so they said they were surprised at how cost effective it would be. So they said the plan is to send 50 samples of sperm for each species. And that's what adds up to the 6.7 million sperm. To which okay. I then go to the other end of the spectrum. It sounds like 50 samples of sperm for a species. Like, is that 50 individual sperm or some unit of, like, a milliliter of sperm? Like, I don't know. That's more than no, I said. I think it's 50 samples. So it's probably millions of sperm for each sample. That, individual. Makes, that makes more yeah. sense. Right. And they say it will only take 250 rocket launches to the moon. And we're like, we're having trouble with oh, one. <laughs> only 250. It'll be done. By the time we're all extinct. Oh, dead. <laughs> right, right. It took 40 to build the International Space Station. So this is just a small multiple of that, 250. Um, and they said, it's not crazy big. We are a little surprised about that. So the I, fact that we're doing this, isn't this just like a, an indictment of like human progress that we even have to do this they should just send yeah. all the other animals except for humans <laughs> well that's my that's my <laughs> i have a few questions here that i've unpacked number one how do you collect well first of all i don't even know how many animals have sperm versus some sort of like dissect a, a morphous sexual division cell division or <laughs> okay <laughs> Just There's on. all the other ways to reproduce, right? And okay. they don't all involve sperm, right? Um, so how do you get the sperm from, like, a bug? Like, how are they going to collect these? It seems like collecting the sperm is as big an issue yes. as getting it to the moon and storing it on the moon. Okay, This is complicated. Yeah, yes. so let's yes. give them the benefit of the doubt and assume that they can get all these to the moon. How are uh, we going to, like, reactivate them? Like, so let's say we what? have, like, like bug sperm, like cockroach sperm. Like, how are we going to use that to make more cockroaches? Like, do we need you a have to of- build a whole space station and have a laboratory in it where you can <laughs> like methodically clone, one by one and there's like <laughs> there's- clone these things. So it's it's a really half baked. It's not even half baked. It's like <laughs> one tenth baked. baked. Not baked. <laughs> and then the question is, can we selectively decide which animals to bring back? Because frankly, like nobody wants mosquitoes. Could we just skip the mosquitoes? Or nobody wants. Be mos- like, nobody needs mosquitoes. But are people no. Be like, oh no, they're part of the food chain. And if we kill the mosquitoes, we'll kill the iguanas. And if we kill the iguanas, we'll kill the crocodiles and blah, blah, blah. That's probably true. Some some <laughs> biologist we'll fuck knows the crocodiles this. also. Okay. So nope to this whole half-baked scheme. No, we're figure keeping, it out. Make keeping, a plan. We're, we're we keep, need to know the ending of this. <laughs> we need an end game. We're, until then, we're keeping the sperm to ourselves. You can't have any. <laughs> no, absolutely not. Okay, so in these troubled times, I know I start a lot of segments with that. Um, one of the great comforts I think back on from the before times was taking the Amtrak to Washington, D.C. And one of the lovely things was when I would pass by Trenton, New Jersey, the state capital of New Jersey, and they have that uh, there's like an overpass and it says Trenton makes the world takes, I guess, hearkening back to a better time when Trenton was a manufacturing center. And I've never uh-huh. gotten off a train in Trenton, but it seems like a very quaint place. Trenton and makes the world what? Trenton makes the world takes. Oh. Like they're, they manufacture and we give what we make to the rest of the world. Oh. Oh, that's nice. Okay. Yeah. It's kind of like we make it, you take it. You give them a finger, they take an arm. Like they you can't. <laughs> that wasn't of, the way I was thinking of it. But, they're a okay. bunch of takers. <laughs> so I have this image of Trenton as this like bucolic set place of like that's the state capital of good government, but all is not as it seems. So I saw this headline and um, the story is worth telling. It's a big cast of characters. It is a it took me a lot to untangle it. I read the article five times for, fig- for figuring out what was going on and being able to overlay a chronology. And I should start with a listener warning that there is some crude language in here that is cruder than usual. And you know we don't shy away from that, but um, we'll say some uh, some potentially offensive things. Okay, so last week in Trenton, or last month, um, there was a big kerfuffle because there were some COVID meetings uh, of the the city council in 2020 that had been private. And there was a demand or a court case to make them public. And that won. And those transcripts were released. And in those transcripts, city council member Jarrell Blakely called city council president Kathy McBride an illiterate crackhead prostitute. 
Oh my God. That's Actually, very New Jersey. That's... Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, and that gets your eye when you're reading the transcript, but then you scroll back a little bit and you realize that the council president had already called council member Blakely a disrespectful piece of shit. So mm-hmm. maybe that's why they had, you know, made these transcript tra- transcriptions private, but now they're out in the public and so forth. So this, it turns out, was just a glimpse into the contentious and frankly bonkers world of Trenton local politics. So <laughs> last week, there was a rally for the president, city council president, Kathy McBride. The speaker was an activist from the New Black Panther Party whose name was Divine Allah. Not young Pharaoh, mm-hmm. divine Allah. He gave a 13 minute speech. And in that, he attacked the mayor, whose name is Reed Gushora, uh, who is gay. Uh, and he called him a little faggot and said that Jews are the true enemy. And given his name, Gushora, which looks Italian, he's probably not Jewish. Okay, so the plot thickens. Earlier, the council member Blakely, this is the one who had called the president the illiterate crackhead prostitute, um, he had called a hearing because that president had said, so the president who was the victim of having been called a crackhead prostitute earlier had, at a city council meeting, had called on the council to Jew someone down. Like, let's Jew her down. Okay. Okay. (laughs) There's a lot of characters This is like an ensemble cast. (laughs) It's hard to keep track we need a of cheat everybody. Sheet. Right. Okay. So to put this in order, I guess, the the city council president, Kathy McBride, first said she was going to juice someone down. <laughs> council member Blakely called a hearing about that. But then yeah. council member Blakely called the McBride an illiterate crack- crackhead prostitute. Then there was a rally on behalf of City Council McBride with Divine Allah, who said those terrible things about the gay mayor and about how Jews are the true enemy. However, this mayor, this is not the first time the mayor has been attacked by members of her own party. Um, Another city council member earlier named Robin Vaughn called the mayor. Oh, no, this is the mayor. The same mayor got called a pedophile and a woman and a bitch ass on a public conference call. But and the mayor's not a woman. The mayor's a man. Oh, the mayor's a gay man. Okay. <laughs> she called I, him. I can't a even keep pedophile. track of the genders of all she- <laughs> Well, her name is Robin, so it could be either. But okay. she called the mayor, who is a man, a pedophile woman, as if that were an insult, and a bitch ass on a like okay. a Zoom call. Right. And then she told another Robin, told another city official to suck the mayor's dick. So I think they need to just purge the entire government right. and get new people. This well, is, this I, I mean, I, unacceptable. all I have to say is that the people of Trenton are in good hands. This is a model of good government. Like they're obviously focused on the business of the people and not on their internecine <laughs> fights about this nonsense. Um, but like, like I couldn't come How up with any happen? one of these insults. And like, this is what happens when you don't pay, when, when a city falls under the radar, when it goes from a manufacturing giant to a bypass on a, the Acela, right? It's, it's, it's in a state of neglect and the inmates are running the asylum. And this right, is what happens. Right. When the world stops taking, when the city stops <laughs> Stops making, making. And the they world stop st- making. <laughs> the world starts giving a shit, and this is what you get. So, no, to everybody in Trenton politics, nope. Um, nope. I am. I am going to follow the story. I'll put a Google alert on news alert on Trenton politics because I am dying to see how this plays out, um, and to see maybe. City Council President Kathy McGride will run for higher office. Maybe she sounds like a garbage monster. Oh my God. I would (laughs) rather have like Danielle Staub from the Real Housewives of New (laughs) Jersey. Teresa Judice is the mayor of Trenton. (laughs) Okay, nope, shut this down. Nope. Okay. Let's uh I have one more item about Wait, uh, but I wanted oh. I had this reminded me of Staten Island. Oh, I wanted to Yeah, so okay. I wanted to tell you like <laughs> of course about you know. <laughs> so, I, Wait, I want to tell you about Staten Island. Tell me so about I Staten was Island. Right reading now. this article in the New York Post about Staten Island politics. Yeah. 
and um the borough president race is heating up and it's very interesting so the candidates are like so staten island it's like they came from central casting so there's city councilman steve mateo who is the first republican to announce his candidacy and he's been endorsed by the borough's gop but then Wait, and for those of you, our listeners, who are not in New York City or familiar with New York City politics, Staten Island is the one borough that is super Republican, super MAGA, the only one that went for Trump. Oh, sorry, I said his name, shit. Um, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. okay. well, there you go. I get an exemption for that. So that's who we're talking about. Yes. So, um, okay, so there's this guy, Steve Mateo. Then there's this new guy, Vito Fasella, who popped into the scene. He's an ex-congressman who had a scandal he had a secret second family and was arrested for drunk driving in 2008 so he's running um and his <laughs> his announcement followed a 2013 flirtation with a potential run for his old seat in congress which at the time was held by then u.s representative michael grimm who <laughs> Yes. infamously threatened to throw a tv reporter <laughs> off of a balcony in the u.s capitol <laughs> was reelected in 2014, but pleaded guilty later that year to tax evasion and was sentenced to eight months in prison. Okay, so that, so we're, that we're, this is a real cast of winners here. Yes. <laughs> like, and then pick. you can't go finally, wrong. <laughs> finally, there's a uh, Staten Island GOP chairwoman, Leticia Romero, who came under fire for shouting Heil Hitler <laughs> at cops. <laughs> <laughs> during a December protest against coronavirus safety protocols. So these are three <laughs> great, <fantastic>. choices. <laughs> great choices. So, <laughs> these are all on the Republican side. And this is um, a borough that tends to vote Republican. On the Democrat side, there's the former congressional candidate, Mark Murphy, who won his party's endorsement last month, and a wine store owner named Bori <laughs> Honor. So hopefully one of those two will prevail. They I'm will not. not. They will not. I'm not hopeful. <laughs> Whatever felon is nominated by the Republicans, I'm sure they will be seated. Um, yes. Um, as, so I just had to bring that so up. So how could we was... combine the worlds of Staten Island and Trenton? That's the real question. Like, I think they should them? merge. <laughs> yeah, <it's a> merge. <laughs> And have like a land bridge between them, <laughs> like have like a safety zone where you could like take the <laughs> demilitarize <laughs> DMZ where they could move. There's like a duty free, like they could move freely between the two. <laughs> they could the just outer... scream at each other. <laughs> <laughs> well, Trenton, they're all Democrats, and Staten Island, they're all Republicans. So finally, maybe oh. it'll equalize the equalize the political balance there. Maybe, maybe they could. Um... They could even each other out, you know. Yeah. yeah, or state or statehood. Give them independent statehood. Yeah, <laughs> Staten Trenton. Not that's that's a great. That would be a great state. <laughs> I'll trade it for DC. Okay, nope to Staten Island also. Okay, nope. <laughs> okay, nope. Um, okay. We're really moving around the nation here. So, um, out, uh, Trenton's is Trenton is the state capital of New Jersey, as I mentioned. I have more state house news this time from the Deep South, Alabama. Uh, where the culture wars are alive and well. And I'm not talking about cancel culture per se. The latest victim of the culture wars is yoga. And you could think, who is against yoga, right? It is universally praised. It's good for the body. It's good for the mind. It's um, no animals Good for harm. the heart. It's, it's good it's for, good. <laughs> that's part of the body. But yes, <laughs> last I checked it's uh, good for the spirit it's yes. just like yes yes yeah. so at some point they realized that um gym teachers were doing yoga to warm up warm the kids up before class and they realized that it's also great when they had virtual learning because it's a way to like calm people down and it's a nice activity that you could do remotely even if it's just sitting silently and like wiggling around in a yoga style but of course, wiggling. <laughs> I've never done yoga. Is that what you, don't you wiggle? <laughs> You've never done yoga. No, I've done it. Seriously, but like, You've done I, it. <laughs> maybe I was just wiggling. You don't wiggle. To, there's no wiggling in yoga. Okay, I stand corrected. In fact, wiggling is the only thing that's <laughs> you prohibited. Don't do it. You're supposed to stay still, right? Okay, so. Um, one, this alarmed some people. So they went back onto the statutes and they found a 1993 Alabama law still in effect that in the public schools bans yoga, meditation, and hypnosis. 
<laughs> why so, are those things grouped together? <laughs> right? So of course I wonder why yoga and meditation are banned, but is there a big problem with like hypnotizing <laughs> fifth graders? Like maybe I agree with that one. Maybe you shouldn't be hypnotizing school children. Yeah. I don't know. So they're anyways. very suggestible. So yeah, I agree right. with that. So but yoga, like one, one heroic state representative decided to take on this issue. Democrat Jeremy Gray of o Opelika, Alabama, and he sponsored a bill to repeal uh, this ban um, and uh, he said that he had been doing yoga for the last seven years. He had found it very therapeutic. He started when he was a college football player, and it got him through some tough times. But it's Alabama, so of course there's a but. So it was repealed, not without opposition. Um, it was the, the ban on yoga was repealed, but there are some caveats. Moves, moves, movements and exercises that are taught to students must have exclusively English names. So... Uh, like you, so you, you can't, can't say like shavasana you can't or say vinyasa like vinyasa yoga like you, they have like, to have americanized names this is so stupid <laughs> right, i right. like i just and, want to and, jump out the window <laughs> and students can opt out if they and do an alternative activity if they or their parents are offended by the presence of yoga in the school um and why would they be offended by that because it's <laughs> well, not american because yes. it's well not, 25 okay. reps in the state house voted against the repeal they wanted to keep the ban in a, in in place and they asked one of them why would you ever vote that way and they said they quote got a lot of emails about being part of hinduism okay to which i say yes it is <laughs> and what and I what's mean. your point <laughs> right <laughs> what's okay. your point right um and these are the same people who are freaking out about allegedly canceling racist dr seuss books and yet right. here they are all worked up and quote unquote canceling yoga who's defending yoga in alabama right. all these first people came, complaining <laughs> first they came for the hypnotists <laughs> they came <laughs> I did not speak out. Yeah. <laughs> we'll speak for the yoga yogis. Um, there is a little postscript here is that once there was a review of this 1993 law that nobody had referred to or, you know, looked back on, they realized that it also banned playing tag in school. And it makes you wonder what was the thinking behind that one? Maybe that like if it's um like co-ed tag they didn't want boys and girls touching each other in a maybe maybe know. tag is from china <laughs> <laughs> it's hindu that the buddhist tag tradition <laughs> must not i mean reach this the... is <laughs> like we are really living in an idiocracy this is this is pathetic. I'm they sorry. are. They are. Yeah. That's the end of my nopes, Rachel. Nope. Okay. Shut that down. Did no. you, have, you? You had one that you texted me about. Did you have one? I did have update? one update. Yeah. So um, last week we talked about this home decor trend yeah. where people are um, having creating bathrooms without walls toilets yes well to one toilet. one per one person i mean we, we didn't really <laughs> but <need that> you, <laughs> right it was one apartment in, in boston, boston yes. <laughs> however the trend is also alive and well out here in the hamptons really as I discovered this week my parents friends bought a house in quag a couple years ago and they just finished building walls around their around their <laughs> around bathroom their <laughs> wait was it like a gut reno and they just had to finish the walls or like no was it, being it was sold just as free... is <laughs> like that was a there was a free... and i said whoa that's um i guess it's not just in boston it's it's a thing People and once are again doing... we're ahead of the curve we're breaking yes. news <laughs> we're breaking open toilet news you heard it here first okay that's one final okay. note let's move on to the ups there's a little raise of light a little beacons of hope that got us through the week rachel you have a fun one here well, um, I was going to talk about WandaVision, but then right before this podcast, I uh, heard Senator Raphael Warnock delivering one of the best speeches I've ever heard ever, um, That's a high ever in my life. The subject was uh, voting rights, and he went into the legacy of voter suppression and racism in Georgia in the wake of this horrible massacre of eight people yesterday, most of them Asian women. Um, I'll link to the speech in the show notes. I think everyone should watch it. Um, I, I've got to just say that every single day, I'm so 
grateful to the people of Georgia for voting for this wonderful man and also John Ossoff. And they're going to make a huge difference. And um, and it was just such a rousing, moving speech. And it just made you realize the importance of getting good people in government and the importance of uh, eliminating these horrible voter suppression rules because otherwise we're fucked. So yeah. yep to that. Well, I have a similar one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> when you said you switched, I was worried you were going to do the same one as me. So my very similar yup goes to sea slugs. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there was a great article in the New York Times Science Tuesday section yesterday about shocking new findings about sea slugs. And it turns out there's a lot of animals that will like sever a limb and then regenerate it or like my octopus friend, if they lose an arm, they'll regenerate it. So it turns out that sea slugs will voluntarily decapitate themselves. Like if their body is infested with parasites and they're like, oh, this is too much problem. I, I can't deal with this <laughs> body anymore. I'm getting rid of it. They decapitate <laughs> themselves, the, the, the head, in over the course of a month will regrow a new body and the body stays alive for another three months and there's this video of the sea slug's head like dancing around the body for like weeks and like prodding it and the body still moves around so like it's playing what's the with dance the for what's <laughs> the dance with the devil i don't know <laughs> Wait, but, so I feel like the, the sperm that's going to the moon right, we should, should question be all Because they can regenerate themselves. We don't have yes. to do any work. <laughs> we'll become a race of sea slugs. They'll just be <laughs> us and the sea slugs. They're clearly more advanced than us. I mean, this is incredible. This is a great yup. I, I love right, it. Right, right. And then there's even more. So at the bottom, <laughs> there's a section like for, for, for further reading because they'll have like a related article. And I thought, okay, there'd be another related article about some animal in its limbs. But there's a whole collection of articles called How Animals Put Themselves Back Together. And oh. here's the list of the articles going back a bunch of years. A worm's hidden map for growing new eyes. Chop up a worm. It will regenerate. Scientists figure out why. Seeking superpowers in the axital genome. Chop off its worm's head and it can still detect light. The hydra gets a new mouth with every meal. How a little bit of hydra regrows a whole animal. Like, there's a These whole body of stuff. are doing all sorts of things. They're doing it all. Doing... They can have it all. <laughs> talk, about, talk about work-life balance. Like, they have head-body balance. But who knew that their time, I mean, there must be someone just on the, like, regenerative zoology beat here. Cause <laughs> That's the best they beat. <laughs> prol they have very prolific output. It's they're... so inspiring. It's so, it's, I, I want that beat. That's yeah, no, I went down a whole wormhole. Dun, dun, dun. Oh, that was terrible. Okay, well, my up goes to the sea slugs we love you so Come raphael warnock and sea slugs. <laughs> sea slugs classic classic podcast nope okay uh thank you for listening uh we appreciate yeah, thank it thank you been, so we, much we've been getting some new reviews not just the five stars but also some reviews people like this podcast never sure why but we'll keep them coming um rate subscribe review tell your friends in person that's the surefire way new people are listening uh people come to me and they say they've been listening a few people this week without me asking them to which is fantastic um and then i worry what they think about me uh after that because i usually know them in a work context and they're like oh i like your new theme song and i'm like you like my what <laughs> they're like oh i listen to your podcast and i'm like Rut row. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but anyway, anyway, it has been a terrible, terrible week, but it has been a fun podcast to record. Thank you for listening. This has been Nope. The podcast where we shut it down. Mm -hmm.